you all. Thank you all for coming along. Um, so we have with us Lisa Van Hoon, all the way from Sydney. So uh, she's in here to get a warm surprise, I suspect. So Lisa is, her visit is funded by SEXA under the Distinguished come on, come on under this Distinguished Visiting Fellow Programme. So she's been visiting Dundee and also Harriet Watts, Edinburgh, St Andrews. Uh, she's also an honorary senior visiting fellow in DJ CAD, a professor in HCI in the School of Computing in UTS, and an associate professor in Eindhoven um, Technical University in Industrial Design. <coughs> So, lots of titles, but for me what's really exciting is the work that Elisa does around materialising memories. So I'll leave Elisa to tell you all about it. Thank you very much, Wendy. Um, first thing first, can you hear me? Because I, yeah? I know I don't have a very loud voice and I don't know what the acoustics do here. So I, because this is not on. Yeah. Okay, well, well, just raise your arm if you can't <laughs> bring it in for her. Um, so, well, thank you all for coming. Thank you for this lovely introduction and for actually uh, hosting me here. So it, it's because of Wendy and our joint PhD student Daniel over there <laughs> that I uh, came to Scotland in the first place. So thank you very much. Um, yeah, so what will I talk about today? Um, I would like to give you an idea of what my design research program is about. It's called Materializing Memories, and I will dissect it um, throughout my presentation. So I'll first give you a quick introduction of my own background, then I will talk about what I mean by materializing, then I'll talk about what I mean by memories, and then I'll give you two uh, examples of case studies Welcome. Um, that uh, combine these two. So first of all, I have quite a, a different background, I would say. So I started out by doing a master's in biology, and I was really interested in perception and how animals including people perceive the world. Um, after that, I did a um, post-master degree uh, in a it's called user system interaction, but it's basically similar to human-computer interaction. Um, and after that, I did my PhD in industry in a big electronics company called Philips Research in, in the Netherlands. And my PhD um, already had something to do with memories. Um, so basically, all the research I've been doing since is a, is a follow-up from that. So here you can see um, a very old photograph. <laughs> uh, so this is me as a PhD student, and um, the, the devices that I hold were part of um, our team's efforts. So the aim, so I was a PhD student in a team of four PhD students and two full-time Philips Research employees. It was an experiment of the company to see whether that would work, if you could have a couple of PhD students work together uh, as part of the company's investigations into trends of the future and whether the company needed to develop different kind of um, well, electronics basically to support these trends or not. So it was a really amazing place to be. It was a whole research group just looking at potential future trends uh, without any boundaries or any requirements at that time changed rapidly afterwards, of course. Um, so what you can see here is, so I'm holding a tablet at that time. So this is um, probably 2000. Uh, it's a touchscreen tablet, which was quite innovative then. Of course, things have changed and you all have one in your pocket, probably. Um, this is um, a, a digital photo browser. So the, the tablet would be connected to a PC hidden in the attic, because that's how it was at that time, where all your digital photo collections would be stored. And you would use the device to scroll through your photos. You could drag them to the middle to enlarge them. You could even drag them to other screens that were available in your living room. So in this case, you see a TV is um, visible as an icon over there, but we also had a digital photo frame um, and it would make it possible to shift from private viewing to public viewing. Um, but my interest was also in um, the objects you see on the, on the table over there. And these are souvenirs that are linked to parts of these digital photo collections and it's called tangible interaction. So how can you use physical objects to link to digital data? Um, and you can even see a representation of the object in the interface. Um, so the aim of our project, the project was called Feelum, by the way, and the aim of our project was to build a memory browser, to build a device that would contain your personal memories. Um, so the, the company back then thought that that was something that might be interesting in the future and the company might need to develop things related to that. Um, 
The funny thing is, so our team was very multidisciplinary, something you will see throughout my talk. I really enjoy multidisciplinary collaboration and even transdisciplinary, I would say. Um, so I was the person looking at the interaction design and at the people we were designing for. And the other three PhD students were in um, electrical engineering, in hardware and in software experts. Um, so I spent quite a lot of time studying cognitive psychology because I wanted to understand memory. <laughs> and I thought that was quite an obvious thing to do when you design for remembering. It turned out not to be so obvious. Um, and a lot of the literature in HCI that relates to memory is actually of people who have not studied how memory works. And you can see that in their papers. So. <coughs> anyway, so that's where I got started. So um, after that, I became an assistant professor in industrial design in Eindhoven University of Technology. Um, then I moved to Sydney, became an associate professor in the School of Design um, in Sydney. And then since 1st of January, I moved faculties and I became full professor in School of Software, actually, if I gave you the wrong information. <laughs> Just because I'm new. Uh, but I kept a joint appointment, so I'm an associate professor as well in Eindhoven University of Technology. Um, yes, um, so I have a joint appointment, which is, I think, a lot of fun. So I literally get the best of both worlds. Um, I, I see a lot of the world, that's one thing. Um, but the, the different academic systems are very inspiring, I would say. So, for instance, one of the things that we have in the Dutch system is we have these public PhD conferences. And I was just wondering if any of you have ever attended the Dutch PhD defense? No? Ah, uh, well, let me know if you're ever in the Netherlands, you would like to attend one. You can be public, you can just sit in. Um, so it would be like a similar room to this, as you can see here. So this was my first PhD student completing her PhD, standing in front. And then me and some of my colleagues were all in the panel. And it's really a nice event, it's like a rite of passage. So the student has submitted her thesis, uh, the committee has commented on it, they have adapted the thesis, and then it's printed in a book. It's really a physical book, it has an ISBN number it's, and stuff. Um, so when you get to this stage, it's, you can't fail unless there's plagiarism involved or something like that. So it's, um, it's really showing your family and your friends what you've been spending all this time on. <laughs> Um, because part of the defense is a layman's talk, so you have to, in 10 minutes, in layman's terms, present your research of the last X years. And it's really a lot of fun. Um, it is important, though, because you know, finding a job in academia is based on how well you then deal with the questions of the panel members. So it is, it is important, you can't fail, it is nerve-wracking, but it's certainly a lot of fun being in the audience. Um, what I like about, for instance, the Australian system, and I think it's um, similar to the English system, is that you can get all Harry Potter up, as we say in Sydney. Um, so we don't have that in the Netherlands, so uh, all the professors wear just black coats and black hats, and there's a little bit of a trim in my <coughs> uh, But not like, I would say, in the Australian universities, where they have very colorful and, I, I think, very nice uh, dresses. And so because I don't come from this tradition, every time I have to show up, I can just pick which dress I would like, because my university doesn't have its own. Uh, so in this case, I thought I'd go for uh, the University of Sydney dress, I like that one. So these, uh, these are some of my graduates from the School of Design, uh, from Product Design. Anyway, my research. Um, so what I'm interested in, um, so in different types of approaches, so design research, and I'll come back to that, human computer interaction, uh, interaction design, user experience design, quite a hot topic at the moment, user-centered design, and even though I try to avoid the word user, I prefer to talk about people. Um, this is the <coughs> term that we still use. And then I'm really interested in, in two different types of application areas, which I try to combine, um, as you will see later as well. And one is physical or tangible uh, interaction, uh, com combined with embodied interaction and human memory and remembering. Um, and I was wondering, um, are you familiar with all of these terms, or is a lot of this really new? Because I don't really know what your audience is. You know all of this, pro probably, Professor Newell, but and some of you will know some of it. But I'll introduce some, just to make sure that, that you have an idea of what I'm talking about. Um, because, for instance, the term design research is used in different contexts and in different ways. Um, so when I talk about it, it's important to realize that it's 
about generating knowledge. So that's the first priority. Research is generating knowledge. And even if it's design research, the aim is not to create the best design. The aim is to generate the most useful knowledge that you can. But you do that through or for design. So through is by making something, for example. And for design is you study something that might then later inspire a design. So knowledge is primary end result. I always tell my design students that if they're really good students, you can have and ability for design and knowledge. Um, but if you have to choose, then knowledge is the primary focus. Um, it can be about anything. It can be about interaction style, about user experience, future scenarios, methods, <coughs> uh, whatever you're interested in. Um, and in my type of design research, it's often qualitative because we study things that have not been done before, so often we come up with new products, for example, and it's really hard then to do quantitative analysis when you really don't know what you're looking for exactly. Um, so we very often, or almost always, start with qualitative uh, studies. Um, so the approach, especially for a non-design audience, um, I often use this um, slide. So for me it's important to start from knowledge, which means literature. Um, especially from social sciences or, for instance, cognitive psychology, um, because I think there's a lot of criticism in HCI that HCI doesn't really have a theoretical foundation or people at least acknowledge it not enough. Um, so I combine you know, HCI knowledge with knowledge from other disciplines to have a, a substantial theoretical basis to what we do. Then we go into an iterative process. Um, this it looks very organized, it can be a bit more messy with iterating in this different phase. So each, each uh, black circle would be a part of the design process. Um, so we have analysis, we have implementation, experimentation and then theorizing for example. Um, so it can be a bit more messy but what I want to say is that it is uh, explainable, it's not random, it's not just intuition that leads to a good design. There's a whole process that leads to an outcome. Um, and then hopefully also the knowledge, so outcome up in a design and then for instance you could evaluate this design and learn from that. Um, when I talk about interaction design I often refer to the book by Yvonne Rogers and Sharper and Priest. Um, I tell my, especially my undergrad students, that that's a really good book to start from if you want to know what interaction design is in how I interpret it. Uh, it's a very specific interpretation, so they define it as interactive products containing embedded electronics that respond to people's actions, um, which means there is a physical component and a digital component embedded in it. And this for me is very important. So you, interaction design can also be interpreted as something that's purely, for instance, web-based and purely digital. For me, when I talk about it, I also think about the physical appearance or um, so what do you need to do? Well, there's lots you need to do before you can create an interactive design. But you need to know what people will want, um, what they can do, what kind of technology is available to you, what the requirements are from, I don't know, the context to the clients to the users. Um, and then evolve it, evolve it into a suitable design, which is not as straightforward as it may sound. Um, and then in my research we focus on the creation of new concepts. So a concept is not yet a product, but it's an idea for a product, and we build prototypes to see how people respond to those uh, ideas, basically. So when I try to sell my type of work to my undergrad students, I would tell them that, for me, interaction design is imagining things. And I think that's really the nice, um, yeah, the nice perspective on what I do. We can just come up with any type of product that we think might make people's lives better or easier more fun. So imagining things as they might be while still satisfying the needs and the desires of people. Now that doesn't mean that the people tell us what to design, not at all, perhaps even contrary, but we, we interview them, we observe them, we really listen carefully uh, and then we decide what we want to take on board and develop further into a potential concept. Okay, enough about uh, definitions. Um, by the way, Wendy, could you indicate time for me? I forgot to ask you. So materializing, so as part of my design research program, um, one of the words is materializing. So let me explain to you what that means, or what it means to me, at least. Um, and before I do so, is anyone familiar with the field of tangible interaction? Have you heard of the word? No? No? You should. Oh, well, I thought that was a suit. <laughs> <laughs> See, at least. <laughs> yeah, <no. laughs> 
So tangible interaction, um, it's basically, uh, it started out from giving a physical form to digital data. Um, so you have digital information, you have things in your computers, in your screens, hidden, um, but there's usually no physical component to it, which makes it invisible at certain points in time, and I'll come back to that later. Um, so tangible interaction started from how do we make a link then to the physical world. So you basically combine the material and the digital. Now why would you want to do this? So this is uh, one of the um, results of a study of one of my former PhD students, uh, Bonnie Holstein. And she looked at, um, she interviewed actually physical crafters and digital crafters. And she studied what hybrid crafting would be. And um, this uh, table just gives you some, an idea of what these crafters thought, and well, she interpreted that, of course, what they thought the advantages were of physical or material things in general, but also of digital, and what the disadvantages are. Um, and by the way, I've put the reference at the top, so I've put in lots of references if you, if you would like more information. Feel free to have a look there, or send me an email, I can tell you too. Um, so, for instance, for physical, you can imagine that material properties are, can have advantages to something. Um, so, for instance, you can have a smell, you can have it make sound, you can feel it, it has a certain weight that has value to people. Um, and one of the examples uh, is, for instance, when I, during my PhD, I studied souvenirs and how people, uh, well, what people said about their souvenirs. And one of, the, one of my participants, he had, um, so souvenirs to me are objects that make you remember things. And there's basically three categories that I identified. One is the traditional souvenir you bring from a holiday. Um, that's what people think of in the first place. Um, second would be gifts. So if people give you something, then over time it can become a souvenir to you. It can remind you of the event or the person who gave it to you. Uh, but a third very important category is heirloom. So things you've inherited or uh, yeah, passed uh, on to you. And so this participant had inherited a chair. Uh, like a lazy chair with these <coughs> armrests, and it used to belong to his grandfather. Um, and it's, um, it was damaged, as uh, uh, like an outsider would say. So his grandfather used to smoke pipe, and um, you know, sometimes these embers, they would fly from the pipe, and they would, uh, well, fly, I don't know if the English word for that, but they would come out, and they would make these, uh, you know, black circular burns in fabric. And so for anyone else, that might be like, diminishing the value of the chair. But to him, that was really important. He said, that's my granddad. He was left-handed, so it's on the left side, on the left armrest. It's exactly where he would put his pipe, and that's what makes this material object so valuable to me. Um, now, this is very hard to achieve in the digital world, so is there something similar? I don't know. Um, so this is definitely an advantage of physical. Then again, advantages of digital are also multitude of them, um, you can easily copy and share while you still keep a copy. So in the physical world, often things are unique, there's only one of them. So if you share them, then you've lost it, basically, or you take a photograph, but it's not really the same. Um, so there's lots of exam examples of why both the physical and material, um, compared to digital, have advantages. And so in tangible interaction, also in my research, we try to combine the advantages of both. Um, so the field of tangible interaction started out actually by being called graspable user interfaces. And the person coming up with the name was George Fitzmorris. He was a PhD student then. Um, and he was working with Bill Buxton, who some of you may have heard of. Uh, and they were working for Alias Wavefront, which is a company who makes uh, computer-aided design software. For instance, Maya, you might have heard of. And George, when he was doing his PhD, um, he told me that uh, he would work, um, he would create software for car designers. So they were <coughs> developing software so that car designers could quickly and uh, efficiently create uh, new designs. Um, but he said, um, you know, I would do the best I can uh, or I could in creating this software for them, but they were never really completely satisfied. And so he went to talk to them and he asked them, like, well, why not? <laughs> and they told him, well, as car designers, we're, we are trained, we have had, I don't know how many years of training in doing physical things, physical activities. So they would have these big pieces of paper, they would work in broad, broad strokes with pencils of all kinds and inks of all, all sorts. And now we have to work with a keyboard. <coughs> 
and well, at that time, I think the, the Wacom tablet was relatively new, but they were already working with the Wacom tablet, as you can also see in the image. But it's still, we can't use our skills in the way that we were trained to. Um, and then he thought, hmm, perhaps I can make a combination there. So you can see a prototype, it doesn't have to look nice to be able to give you lots of knowledge. Um, and what he created is these objects that you see on the Wacom tablet, they respond, um, um, or actually the computer responds to your actions on these objects. So there's an eraser over there, there he had different types, uh, kinds of pens, he had um, something that you could mix colors with, uh, that all would be based on the physical equivalent. And then he did tests with these car designs, so he had them use um, his, what he called it, the graphical user interface, but also the well, traditional keyboard and mouse. And the car designers were extremely pleased. Uh, so first of all, it was closer to the skills that they had acquired during the training, but it turned out they were much faster at doing it too. So they were much faster at making the designs they had to make using these physical objects that <coughs> they needed to learn, or, well, they probably already knew, but all the shortcuts on the keyboard. It's just that the physical was faster. Um, so Grass will use interfaces, he defined it as to allow direct control of electronic or virtual objects through physical handles for control. Later this term evolved into tangible use interfaces and even uh, a bit later than that, tangible interaction. Um, so the field of tangible interaction started from computer science and engineering, um, but now we also try to include the social sciences and art and design. Um, I'm even happy to say that at the moment it's not only, you know, you have digital data and we want to combine it with the physical, we also do lots of studies where we start from the physical and actually we see how we can enrich it with the digital. Um, so TI has come, or the tangible interaction community, sorry, has come um, quite uh, some way. So there, so this is what I was referring to earlier, so TI is the, the conference series that we have. So it's an annual uh, conference called Tangible Embedded and Embodied Interaction. Um, I'm actually the vice chair of the steering committee, so that's why I talk about me all the time. Um, and it's really a great community, and if, you, if you're interested in this kind of um, stuff, then feel free to come and participate. So the next one will be in Yokohama at Kaido University of Media Design uh, in March. Paper deadlines are always around the 1st of August, and it's a very, um, it's a medium-sized community, I would say. So last time we had 330 participants. It's single track. You can meet everyone, also the hot shots, because it's not that big, and it's very hands-on. So we would also do physical activities together. So um, one of my favorites has been glass blowing with electronics, which was amazing, uh, with a professional glass blower who would lead, um, well, host us, us in his studio and show us how to do it, it was really cool, anyway. Um, so if you want to have, get more of an idea of the conference, in 2013 the chairs had uh, a professional video made, it's a 30 minutes actually, a video which, is, which you can find on the website up there, which shows you talks, uh, visitors, activities, and gives you a general vibe of, I don't know, we had an arts exhibition there, and things like that. Anyway, that's uh, enough PR, I think. Um, Memories. So that was my brief introduction into what I consider materializing. Um, memories. Yeah, where would we be without our memories? Um, well, it's very hard, I think, to live a normal life without your memories. And that's because it's, you use them all day, every day. And you're usually not aware of it. So for instance, we use our memories to build our identity. So if you don't remember what you've done in the past, it's really no, it's really difficult to know who you are, who you think you are. Um, we use them to base our opinions on. We make plans based on memories of prior activities. Um, we build and maintain relationships based on our memories, and we do that by sharing our memories with other people. Um, so it's really, really important. I want to say that I will particularly speak about one type of memory. It's called autobiographical memory. Um, there's overlaps with episodic, and the experts are not yet sure how it overlaps, or actually they, they disagree, I would say. Um, so autobiographical or slash episodic, uh, which is the type of memory that um, contains your memories of the events you have experienced during your lifetime. And I make this very explicit because um, human memory is not yet well understood. There's lots of people studying it from all kinds of disciplines. Um, and one um, way of identifying is not yet 
well understood is that in literature there have been 256 types of memory identified, which means people have an idea, they give it a name, they put it out there, and then other people do the same thing, and they keep on coming up with ideas, but we don't know yet how it all integrates. And if, so some of these ideas are based on neuroscience, like literally physical structures that have been identified. Others are more, like autobiographical memory, are more based on cognitive psychology, like what people remember and the content of their memories. So it's not very well understood, but my interest is in the things that people remember of their own life, which is a retrospective type of memory. <coughs> you, for instance, have also prospective memory, where people try to remember things in the future, like tie a knot in your handkerchief kind of thing. Uh, but you also have procedural types of memory, which means that your body remembers actions. So, for instance, if you know how to ride a bike, then your body will, will remember how to do that next time. You might not have to think about it at all. So there's, very, there's a large variety of different types of memory. Um, but autobiographic memory in particular um, functions include um, using the past to guide your thought and behavior in the future which is called the directive function. You also have a self-representative function. So how do you create a sense of identity and continuity, which is really important. And this also links to life stories and life narratives that people try to make a coherent and consistent story out of the things they've done in their life, thereby often leaving out things that do not match what they feel is their identity at the moment. Um, and they're often not aware of it, it's very fascinating. And then also the social function, so developing, maintaining and nurturing relationships by sharing intimate details that other people cannot know because these are your experiences. And these details are, so your memory is layered, there's three layers um, stored in your brain. So you have the lifetime periods, it's called. So these are overarching things like when I lived in Dundee, for example, or when I studied at the university, that's a lifetime event. It's uh, a lifetime period, it's really, it's, it could be a couple of years worth of memories all combined. Then a layer below of that is called general events, so things that might be recurring, like I went to a, a seminar today, you might do that every week. And then you have what's called event-specific knowledge, or actually those are the details of unique events. And those things are stored in different parts of the brains from the life appearance in the general events, and you forget them really quickly. So by sharing these details, you build kind of an intimacy with someone else, and that person is then very likely to share some details with you too, which means building up a relationship. Uh, just curious, who of you have seen this movie? Oh, quite some hands, really good. So I loved it. I watched it again on the plane coming out to Scotland. Um, this movie is about memory. And um, these characters that you see here, they are in the brain and in the memory of a young girl. Um, you can see Joy over here. She's the yellow girl and she's really happy and she colors memories uh, yellow. So she's actually holding some of the happy memories. And then there's sadness and of course she feels blue, so she colors memories um, blue. Um, and so these characters, they represent how emotions are attached to memories and that's a very important link uh, in the brain. And so for instance, memories that are um, very emotional to you, you will remember much better than the ones who are more neutral. Um, so the movie gets a lot right on how human remembering works, um, but not everything. So for instance, here they're standing in, in long-term memory. Um, so you see the archives in the back and then I neatly lined up and organized, well, that's not how it works. Uh, and of course our memories are not marbles, but our memories are not even like identities uh, or sorry, entities as such. So the way your memory works is that you do not store a memory as one thing. You actually store concepts. And these concepts are linked to other concepts. Um, so I would typically give the example of a Dutch breakfast. So I'm, I'm Dutch and we eat sandwich and cheese for breakfast. So for me, the, contact, uh, the, the concept of breakfast is strongly associated with sandwich and with cheese. And the more often I would have a sandwich with cheese, the stronger this connection becomes. So if you were to ask me, like, what did you have for breakfast three years ago on a Tuesday morning, I would think that I would remember um, that I had a sandwich cheese. Because statistically, that's the highest chance of what might have happened. It might not have happened. I really don't know. But you think you remember because the connection is really strong. Unless there's like very specific circumstances that make you remember something uh, exceptional. Um, so this is not how it works. But people have thought it worked like this 
for uh, centuries. So until I think only the 1960s is when the neuroscientists found out that it wasn't stored like this. Um, but even Plato thought it was, so he had a really nice metaphor. He says, your memory is like a cage of birds, and each event or each experience is a bird, and uh, the only problem is catching it. But once you've caught it, you'll remember everything associated to the event. Not true. So don't believe it. Um, and so this is very important to realize, because that means that your individual experiences are not stored as one coherent thing, um, and that things are very organic and can change, which means that you cannot trust your memories. So they, you cannot trust them in representing what has actually happened to you or what you've experienced. Scary, isn't it? Mm. I hope I have more good news later. But anyway, um, so why is this relevant for HCI? Remembering in general, because we often use technology supporting it, or at least we try to. Um, so we use phones, laptops, tablets, um, different types of communication, um, digital media, like photos or videos or documents, and of course all kinds of apps and websites. And uh, I can actually recommend uh, the app called Room for Thought. It's one that me and my team, we all use. Um, and it's an app that every day at a random moment tells you to take a photograph. Not to think too long about it, just take a photograph. And then at the end of the year, uh, well, so you can look through it, of course. You can also look through other people's um, photos. Uh, but you, at the end of the year, you can also order a little booklet. And so they would print all your photos and you have an overview of your year. Um, and it's, it's really fun also how people use it differently. So in my team, different team members use this app in a different way. Um, for instance, some immediately when your mobile phone reminds you, they take a photo and indeed don't think about it. Others have specific interests, so I have one of my PhD students, he's a big fan of shoes. So whenever it goes like, oh, which shoes am I wearing today? And then it's really nice actually because you see where you are based on you know, the, the things surrounding your shoes or what kind of floor you are on. Uh, then I have someone who always takes photos of himself. <laughs> so it's like, okay, who am I with? Mm -hmm. Selfie. Um, so it's, it's really a nice thing of, uh, well, reminding the everyday things and not just taking photos of special occasions, for instance. Okay, um, so designing for remembering, or the, the research that, that we do, uh, is becoming increasingly popular. So it's increasingly popular both in industry and academia. There have been really big grants <coughs> awarded in this area, um, and large uh, calls have been announced for um, lots of millions of pounds and dollars and euros. Um, it integrates a number of fields, including psychology, of course, uh, design, computer science and engineering. And it relates to some of the, the hot topics at the moment, privacy, the cloud and the internet things. Um, so my perspective is that uh, people who work in this area, who use technology to support remembering, they can be on this axis from you know, being very people-oriented and people-focused to being very technology-focused and in particular life-logging. Um, I don't know if that's a familiar term for you. Is life logging familiar? Some of you not, yes, others don't. Um, so life logging means that you use technology to automatically capture as much as the technology can capture. And so for instance, the Microsoft Sense Scan is a well-known camera. You can wear it around your neck and every five minutes um, it will take a photograph. But I mean, it would be like this, like hanging. So the photos would be blurred, skewed, uh, not in focus. You get lots of crap. <laughs> Um, but it, it can be useful in specific um, context. Uh, it was originally developed because the technology was there and it was possible to develop it. And only now I think life logging has been more um, studied in how it can be used and how it can be useful for people. So for instance, one of the really cool studies I've seen, and which was actually published in the special issue that I reference up there, was for people living with dementia who would be wearing such a camera and it would actually help the carers and the therapists knowing <coughs> what kind of things they had been doing throughout the day or the week and gave them points to start a conversation which can be really difficult for people who do not remember what they have been doing. Um, anyway, my work is more on the people side of things, so I called it Meet Memory Support System. So we look at how we can support people's remembering activities. So not necessarily the memory, but remembering important difference. Um, so as I told you, memories are not fixed, they can change, and you cannot store them, so how can you then designing, design for remembering? Um, so what we do is we look at memory cues. Quite a number of our studies look at memory cues. 
And a queue is a little bit of information that helps you reconstruct a memory. Um, so for instance, this is, for me, uh, a memory queue, and it might even be a memory queue to Wendy. Um, so when my team, so my team is located in three uh, countries, so here in Dundee, in Eindhoven, and in Sydney. Um, so we're, you know, we're all over the place, but as soon as we have the majority of the group together, we do fun things. Uh, so it's team building, it's you know, getting in, uh, up to date on what everybody's been doing. And so this is one of those days where I organized a photography workshop for the team in The Rocks in Sydney. And I bought these two big M's, because of course Materialized Memory is abbreviated as MM. And we would just go around town and put the M's everywhere and take photographs of them. So for me, this is a memory cue of that wonderful afternoon that I had with my lovely team. Um, but it might not mean anything to you. It might also work as a cue for you because of other reasons. So uh, a cue could be anything. So it could be, for instance, the color in this image or just, you know, being reminded that something needs painting or something like that. It could be the weirdest things um, that could work as a memory cue. Um, now what's really interesting to know is that so people collect cues, right? So a digital photograph is a memory cue or can be a memory cue, I should say. Uh, so people collect them a lot. But what we know from research is that material cues um, are much more cherished by their owners than digital. Um, we do not yet completely understand why, but I think one of the reasons is that we don't encounter the digital cues as much. And that is, A, because we have many more. So people take huge amounts of photographs, really ridiculously large numbers, then don't organize and don't archive. Um, and but secondly, I think because it's behind the black screen. Um, so, for instance, with physical memory cues, so let's say you've printed off a digital photograph and you, you put it on your wall in your living room, if you have guests over, they will point at it and ask you, hey, where have you been? Is that new? And they will start a conversation. And that's, um, it's also part, it's called rehearsal. So you will remember and rethink that event. And that strengthens the connections between these concepts in your brain. So your memory becomes stronger when you do so. So when you don't encounter your cues, you will forget. You will start to forget. The connections become weaker. And so I've chosen this picture because it's part of the, it was part of the photography workshop. Um, but it was one of those images that I had completely forgotten about. But uh, before, before this talk, I was going through my collection to see what kind of images could I use to support my story. And I was like, hey, <laughs> because I just didn't come across it. And even though this is only one and a half years ago, I think, when you were in Sydney. Yeah? So one and a half years ago, I had already completely forgotten about this beautiful image, which I didn't take, by the way. One of my BC students, he makes much better photos than I do. Um, yes, so what do we do in our research program? So we, uh, a lot of my students focus on digital photos because that's the most used cue and people have uh, a lot of them. Um, but what we do, so this is one of my PhD students, um, is we look at how other people create, curate, manipulate, use, not use, cues. So in this case it's one of my PhD students is taking a photograph and my other PhD student is taking a photograph of the PhD student taking a photograph. And then. Um, so photos are uh, important memory cues. Okay, my, um, my research program. I have 10 more minutes, man. Uh, yeah. <coughs> uh, I'll, I'll go uh, a bit faster. Too slow. Sure. Um, so, first of all, my long-term vision is to achieve transdisciplinary contributions because, you know, because we're working in between psychology, design, computer science, and engineering. I feel it's really important to not only compute, uh, contribute to HCI or human computer interaction, but for instance, also publish in psychology journals, which is actually quite a challenge if you're not a psychologist. Um, so, um, yeah, I think that's really important to show the quality of our work, but also to show to other people that, in our case, uh, HCI or interaction design can actually be beneficial to people who have a specific outlook on how you should do your research. Um, so, uh, for materializing memories, um, our aims are to understand the relationship between media remembering and forgetting. I haven't spoken about that, but it's also very important. Um, to investigate how people experience these remembering activities. And then um, some of my students, I have a very mixed bag of backgrounds in my team, some of them also create media products to support remembering experiences. We look at people with healthy memories, but um, we also collaborate with a local hospital in Sydney called the Royal Prince Alfred Hospital. 
uh, with neuropsychologists who diagnose people with memory problems. And in particular, we have a couple of my team members are interested in looking at people living with dementia. Um, yeah, feel free to visit our website, so it's materializingmemories.com. Um, the work that has not yet been published, will, you will not find it on there, so it's, um, yeah, privacy, how do you call that? Um, that's funding body requirements, so there might not be all on there, so just get in touch with us if you want to know more. Um, my team is quite large. Um, these are some of the people who, who do the real work. So these are not the supervisors like Wendy and myself, sorry Wendy. Uh, but the people who do the actual research. And Daniel's even on there. Which one? The uh, digital media after a couple of separate. Yeah, so like in the middle. You can recognize by the English flag. <laughs> um, you don't have to read all of this. It just gives you an idea of the types of topics that we cover. Because materialized memories may sound like a narrow thing, but it's actually quite broad. So it's from, you know, one of my PhD students is a goldsmith. He actually looks at jewelry because it's often created to um, be well, used for generations and to be passed on and therefore um, also be remembered. Or it's specifically designed to remember someone or something, for example. Um, uh, Identities in there, of course, memory cues, of course, photos, but also reflection. How does remembering, um, how can you use reflection based on your memories in everyday life, and how can we design devices to support you doing that? Um, I have one PT student, she's particularly interested in forgetfulness, and um, she actually has a paper out in CHI, which is in a couple of weeks, which is the main conference in our field. Uh, about forgetfulness and how people deal with forgetfulness. And she's now doing the same study with people with dementia, which is quite a challenge, I can tell you. Uh, not only from the ethical perspective, but yeah, in general. Um, so the team is, is big <laughs> and we're quite diverse, I would say. And yeah, I think they all do a lovely job. Um, and Wendy and I also have a vacancy, so if you know someone who's interested in doing a PhD, it's also a joint, so a lot of my students are joint, like myself, they are between a couple of universities. Um, so Wendy and I managed to get a Microsoft PT scholarship and um, it will be joined between Dundee and UTS. Um, well, the topic is about um, uh, grammar of actions for files, so we think that digital documents or digital things at the moment have just a limited number of actions you can do with them. And if you look at how people use these, these files, and we will look at specific use cases, it's not yet fixed, but it could, for example, be uh, women transitioning into motherhood, then we think we can expand um, the grammar of actions for files. And this is, of course, something that's very much of interest to Microsoft as well. So this will be a design research um, PhD. Um, so, yeah, just get in touch with us if you know of anyone who's interested. The app will be out soon and we'll be hiring this soon. Um, well, <coughs> because I just moved, this is an old photo. This was the lab before I came to Scotland and they're now moving into our new lab, but then you have an idea of this is part of my team uh, in Sydney. Okay, I wanted to quickly go through um, two examples. Yeah, I'll go quick. Uh, so the first one is about involuntary memory cues. So this was a study done by one of my PhD students and it's like at the early stages of the design research project, which means it's, um, it's more of an analysis or an explorative kind of activity where we wanted to figure out um, whether people are cued in everyday life without them looking for a cue. That's so you can actively go through your digital photo collection to remember a certain event, but it also happens to you just randomly when you don't expect it and you're not looking for it. And that's called involuntary memory cues. Um, so what he did is he did a diary study. So he designed the diaries that you can see in the image over there. Uh, he handed them out to people and they walked around with them for two weeks and they recorded all the things that involuntarily they remembered. And, and our interest was to see what made them remember and what kind of memories were they. Um, and yeah, so we followed it up with a semi-structured interview. Uh, and then my student did a qualitative thematic analysis, as some of you might be familiar with. So he nicely put that into a little video. So you look, go through the diaries, come up with nice quotes, and then you try to see if there's themes emerging from these quotes. Um, so by the way, for more information, see the paper. <laughs> I'm going really fast now. Um, so these are some of the categories that he identified that were really interesting from the examples that people noted down in the diaries. So, for instance, social media um, was a big um, factor in involuntary memory cues. So people would just go to Facebook for a certain reason, but then be cued 
by messages or posts or all kinds of other things that they hadn't anticipated and might not even have been looking for. So social media was a big one and food was a really big one, which we completely did not expect. It might be because it's in Australia and they're all foodies, um, but so food, the smell and the taste would bring back memories of all kinds. Uh, also the environment, like where you are, it might remind you of a place you've been before. Um, um, objects, of course, physical objects, um, and the scarf I'll come back to later. So for instance, an object, so this was one of the examples. So in a diary, the people had to finish sentences, like I noticed this and I remember that and this made me feel blah. So that was the task they had to do in the diary. And so for instance, for this radio, um, the participant um, was cued for his father. He said, my father always had the ABC on the Australian Broadcast Channel uh, during the day. So he would listen to sports, news, classical music, and just see his radio, even though it was not his dad's, it made him uh, remember his father, and that he was so proud of his dad, and that he loved him so much. So that's an involuntary uh, memory cue, cued by this particular radio. Um, there are also more complicated cases. So for instance, this scarf um, <coughs> was knitted by someone for the participant. So it was a friend, she made this scarf specifically for her, and um, at that time they were really close friends and it was very valuable to her, but later, uh, I don't know what the reason was, but the friendship stopped, so they, they stopped being friends. And suddenly this scarf had this amazing <coughs> so on the one hand it was very much appreciated and it represented the good times they had and you know the time and effort she spent in making it, but then it also reminded her of why they broke up. And the owner of the scarf, she felt it was her fault, so it was very ambivalent, this object. Um, so these are just some of the examples of objects that people um, were cued by without wanting to be cued. Um, so how is this relevant for HCI? So we look at this um, from the perspective of how can we use the... Ah, I have to speed up, sorry. Two more minutes. Uh, so for instance, what is the right moment of presenting a cue is something that we found was really important that we should consider as designers. Uh, but also how something becomes a cue and how it... Um, builds all this meaning because it usually is over time and by being frequently or yeah um, more often being exposed to a cube. Okay, I have to move on because I want to quickly also show this example because this is a collaboration I did um, with Wendy. Um, it's called Story Shell and Story Shell is a design created by a student that Wendy hosted here at the University of Dundee, Miriam uh, Julius, some of you might have met her. Um, and the aim of the project was to design a bespoke memorial. So this was a very specific type of remembering, in this case remembering someone who has passed away. Um, and Wendy in her earlier work, she um, created a framework for how you could potentially design these digital memorials. So this project was actually um, a, like a proof of the, the framework. So can we use this framework to create a design or perhaps should we adapt the framework? Um, so that's like the second half in the design process, if you remember my circle. Um, now I won't go through the details, you can ask Wendy for all the details if you want to, she knows much more about it than I do. Uh, but these are some of the things that um, were important in the study. So the focus was on a parent, uh, the participant was a parent who had lost her son when he was 15. Um, so the parent is called uh, Myra and it's fabulous, I think, that she uh, agrees to have her name published in the end, so that's her real name, because she was so, well, satisfied, I don't know, she couldn't say happy, but satisfied with the whole design process and the whole project. Um, and what she wanted is she wanted a, a, a device that would help her remember her son, but also the friends of her son and how they were living their lives after her son had passed away because he passed away when he was 15, this was done approximately five years after. So the friends of her son, who would usually, I imagine, come over to the house, had now moved out of town to go to uni, and so she lost contact with them. Um, so she wanted an object that would make her yeah, listen in, basically, on what his friends were going through in life. Um, so the design um, looked like this in the end. And what it is, it's an object that you can hold in your hands. It's about this size. And you can hold it to your ear. And it can play messages that people have left. Um, so Miriam, the student, she created a dedicated Facebook page where the friends of Myra's son could post messages. And then she could listen to them in the privacy of her own home. Um, I think the object is really beautiful. And it represents um, also Myra's sense of aesthetics. So she had a say in what it would look like. 
but also it represents her son, so that was really important. So as you can see in the inside, and perhaps you can see it a little bit better over here, um, there's three different designs integrated into the golden interior. And the middle part represents a rose, because her son had put a rose on someone else's grave, and she thought that was such a nice gesture that should be represented in a design. Then the second part, you can see these are mountains, or do you call them mountains here in Scotland? Yeah. <laughs> I was thinking hills with mountains. Um, these are mountains where her son used to uh, enjoy walking, hiking, running. Yeah. Uh, so that would represent her son as well. And then the outside, these are feathers and they represent birds. Do you, what was this link to? He, he used to draw birds and feathers a lot. Oh, he used yeah. to draw them. Yeah. So, so as you can see, these are different aspects of the life of her son represented in the design that none of us would recognize. It's not very open, but it had a lot of meaning, meaning to the mother. Um, and so this was linked to the Facebook page, so it could light up. There were very subtle lights in there and it could play these messages. Uh, and this is the mom actually holding it. Last thing, so what we learned from all of this, and we published this, so if you want more information, look at the paper. Um, so what's really important is that it leads to curation, actually. So if you want to memorialize something or someone, you have to make choices of what you want to keep and how you want to represent someone. You can't just have these 10,000 images, it doesn't work. Um, and that temporality was something that was missing from the framework, so it was very useful to test the framework in this design to then improve the framework. But more importantly, um, I think, was that the, the participatory design, so the mom was really involved in the process. Um, she saw or experienced it as a therapeutic process. For her, it was really important to people actually listening to her and taking the time and effort to understand how she felt and what she was going through. Um, so my last slide, um, so just summarizing, so what's for me important for you to remember is that I try to work with transdisciplinary, so materializing memories is about combining these different disciplines and looking into media, remembering, forgetting uh, people's experiences and then designing media products for it. Thank you very much. <laughs>